for this tool that I'm calling, calling Hatch Shader, um, I'm creating a tool that's entirely representational. Uh, it's operating uh, for me to be able to represent a geometry in a very specific way. But the represent representation isn't just um, kind of purely aesthetic, or at least the aesthetic has a uh, functionality, which is to say um, it's trying to solve a certain kind of problem for me. And the specific kind of problem I'm looking to solve is right now I have this baked geometry which came from the spider sack and the, um, the table, uh, the pinup table tool. Um, and I want to both have this be transparent um, and also see the floor plates, but I also want to highlight the kind of materiality of uh, the surface. Um, and I, I also want to highlight it based on uh, which, um, which parts of the surface have these kind of smaller areas, panels, and which parts of the surface of this outer wrapping have larger areas. Um, now, th you know, the f there are a few ways I could do this. I could do this with transparencies, but I want to hatch this. And so I want to mix, have different hatching patterns, um, or at least different hatching patterns focusing on different areas. Um, and I want to uh, thus mix how I'm representing my geometry with what I also want to re represent, which is why I'm calling it a kind of functional or at least a kind of a uh, an aesthetic uh, or representation approach that's oriented um, towards as a tool. So I have this geometry, and right now there's this inner geometry and there's an outer mesh. And I'm going to use this mesh. And I've now placed this mesh on a layer I'm just calling envelope layer. And so I'm going to walk myself through this, uh, this process. First of all, um, what I want to do is I want to be able to grab uh, the geometry in this mesh, and I want to uh, grab mesh. I want to be able to divide it out uh, into its faces um, because it has many different faces. Get faces, and on each face, I want to say hatch the face. This is pretty simple, but obviously there's a lot of uh, kind of inner uh, process involved in to here. So the question is, how do I hatch um, the faces that I get? Now, there are some ways I can modify um, my hatching method. And just for the sake of this tutorial, I'm going to say that I'm only going to hatch the faces that are similar to each other or parallel to each other. Um, so I'll say hatch parallel uh, faces parallel to each other or a, a s or a designated face. Um, and what this really is, is I want to grab the faces that are parallel to each other. And then I want to hatch those faces, right? Um, hatching to the face is also kind of you know, not not as simple, obviously, as the single kind of uh, pseudocode lets us understand. But I think this is a kind of a, a good enough process for the time being. Um, we can expand this as we go along. So grabbing the mesh. By now, you should be pretty used to the geometry pipeline. And I'm going to go in and say envelope layer. I'm going to double click on the mesh. So now we're grabbing the mesh. As you can see, it kind of uh, highlights as green. So we've already done the grab mesh portion, actually. Getting the faces. Um, in the mesh component, in analysis, there is deconstruct face, uh, uh, deconstruct mesh, sorry. And if you plug uh, a mesh into here, you get all the components of the mesh, the vertices, the faces, the colors, etc. Um, I'm going to grab the faces. That's what we need. Let's first look at that. So this is the notation of the face. Um, it's uh, operating off of the vertices, which is why you get this list of numbers. Um, and I can't plug it into the geometry component because it's actually not geometry, it's data. But what I can also do is I can go in and ask the mesh to uh, deconstruct the faces. So if I do that, it'll give me all the vertices of the face. Um, I am also able to convert the, the faces into um, planes, BREP planes, or at least to polylines. I can do that by uh, clicking on face boundaries. So instead, um, if I plug in the meshes, actually, I, I have to plug in the initial mesh, um, I would get all the boundaries. I get 46 boundaries um, because there are 46 faces. I'm actually going to use this instead. <coughs> 
And again, oftentimes you get a list uh, and it's hard to, it's easy to not be able to understand exactly what's going on. So I'm going to use the list item and a slider just to iterate across our list. Um, and if I move that slider, I'm going to hide this geometry just so we can see better. So you can see there's a there's a green highlighted portion over here. And as I move the, my slider, the the face that's highlighted changes. I'm going to click on this uh, this component just so that uh, this button so that we can just see exactly what's going on. You can see uh, the face that I'm selecting is changing. So that's great. So we now we have all the faces um, of. Uh, the mesh and they're technically uh, all polylines but I could as easily make them into planes um, uh, let's see I could, I could as easily make them into planes um, with boundary surfaces I'll make my script a little bit slower um, but you can see that I've you know turned the the planes of the mesh into the surfaces um, I'll leave that for now, but it's not really necessary, but I'll just keep that for now. So now we've gotten the faces, which is excellent. So we want to grab the faces parallel to each other or designated face. Um, this is a little bit harder than it sounds. Um, but essentially what I want to do is uh, let me extract an item. So. Right now, I have uh, I have this face extracted, and what I want to do is I want to get all the faces in this mesh that are parallel or similarly parallel to a given degree <coughs> with this face. Um, so you can imagine that this one and this one, these two, uh, get uh, also selected, but this one does not because it's not as parallel. Now, how do I do that? Um, Every face or every geometry um, or every plane uh, can, every every flat plane, and in this case we have a mesh, so we're dealing with flat uh, geometry, planar geometry all the time. Every plane has also a vector corresponding to it. Um, in this case, the vector coming out of it uh, happens to be, um, kind of looks like this green arrow, which is uh, actually the y-axis. It's not always, but the vector that's coming out of it is normal uh, to the plane. Um, just to clarify, by that I mean if you have a plane in the x and y direction, the uh, the normal vector coming off that plane is vertical um, in the z direction, like this, like so. Um, you could re rotate this entire assembly. And this vec uh, this line would represent um, roughly the normal vector to this plane. So we want to grab if we grab the normal vector of this plane, and then we grab the normal vector of these uh, mesh edge so fa faces. What we can do is we can compare the vectors together to each other, and figure out how apart or how different the vectors are in terms of an angle in three dimensions. And then using that, we can say the tolerance and say, okay, well if these two faces, if this face and this face over there is more than or less than 10 degrees um, apart from each other, then we'll call it, okay, they're re reasonably similar, and thus we'll grab that face and accept that face and collect it into a, into a list. And so that's a way in which we are grabbing faces parallel to each other if the normal vectors of the faces align. So first of all, um, we have to designate kind of a face, a designated face. Um, and I'm actually going to use this one. And... Uh, We'll call it designated face. And we'll put it on its own layer as a shorthand. Um, and I'm going to change the layer item. And actually right now, uh, I'm getting a surface, not a mesh, because I had baked it out. That's OK. Um, so now I have this geometry. And what I want to do is I want to convert it into a plane or get the planar version of this geometry. Um, the thing about Grasshopper that's also very helpful is that if you're dealing with um, flat geometry, you can feed it directly into the plane component and it'll automatically convert it into for you. Um, if you feed not flat geometry, that won't necessarily be the case. So you know you want to do something like uh, 
go into uh, analysis um, or actually, and do something like a test whether the surface is planar, which I believe uh, will give you the actual surface plane, even if it's not planar. In our case, we're, we're going to be dealing with this flat surface. So now we have this plane. Um, and the plane, if you dissect it out, uh, shows you the origin of the plane and the z-axis. So all planes are actually defined in relation to their normal vector. Um, so the other trick is that we can take uh, the vector component and plug it in, and that will give us uh, the normal value uh, uh, or the normal vector of our plane, as you can see. So that's great. And just in case we want to uh, see what's going on, we can use the vector display component to plug the vector into the vector display comment. A takes the anchor point, so I'll take, uh, I'll actually, I want to get the O, the origin of the plane. So what I can do is I can use plane origin. Uh, oh, sorry, the plane origin actually gives you, or it lets you set the origin of a plane. You can use the, uh, the deconstruct plane component to you, you'll put in a plane and you'll get you can get the origin. So if I link the origin to the vector display, you can see that uh, I'm getting the vector here as this uh, arrow um, pointing into the surface in this case. Um, so okay, so that's great. So now I have the vector. I also want to get the vectors of all the meshes. Um, what I can do is I can get face normals. Um, so if I plug in the mesh. This will give me a list of all the center points and all the face normals. So you can see here are all the normals. And I can do the same vector display just to see what's going on. I'll give it the center points and the normals. And great, you can see um, all the vectors are pointing towards the normals. Um, so this is my list of vectors. And so this is my list of vectors, and this is my vector. So now I want to know um, how uh, they align to each other, or in what case I can tell whether they're a parallel or not parallel. So OK, how do I get the angle between two vectors? Um, well, this is a little bit of math. Uh, and actually, you could do this in a few ways. Um, you could uh, Google something like how to find an angle between vectors. Um, uh, between two vectors. Uh, but the long and short of it is that um, the dot product, um, as distinguished from the cross product, the dot product of two vectors is the magnitude of each vector cosine the theta of the angle between each vector. Um, and if you have two unit vectors, which is to say two vectors in which uh, the each of the magnitude of the vectors are one, then you can multiply, uh, then the, the dot product is b just the cosine theta of the angle. So if you get the dot product and do uh, inverse cosine, um, or uh, then you can figure out what the theta is. Um, there's, you know, if you Google, there's also kind of more simplified ways to find that out. Um, inevitably, some kind of operation is going to, uh, some sort of, sometimes analyses in Grasshopper are inevitably going to involve uh, some sort of spatial mathematical calculations. So I'll write this out again. If you have uh, angle A, you can write this for the dot product, and angle B, the dot product of both are the amplitude of each vector times the cosine of the theta. Uh, and if each of those vectors are unit vectors, and that means that A the dot product is cosine theta, or the the um, inverse cosine of the dot product equals theta. So what we're going to do is we're going to unitize these vectors. So I'm going to get the unit vector. Um, a unit vector, again, is a vector in which that has amplitude of length uh, 1. And I'm going to get the dot product of these two vectors. And actually, it looks like the dot product already unitizes the input for us, which is incredibly convenient. So I'm going to set this to true and bypass uh, these things. Grasshopper is very convenient like that. And so now what we should get out of here is um, the cosine of theta. 
and then I'm going to use arc cosine. So plug this into here, and this should give us a theta value. Now these are radians, um, so I'm going to convert these to degrees just so that it's a little bit easier or intuitive to read them. And now we can get the angle between vectors. So we can see all these different values. Um, I'm going to wrap this into a cluster, and I'll say degrees between vectors. This is a convenient way to see what's going on. Now, you might want to know, like, how exactly is this true? How can you prove this? Well, I'm going to copy this over um, and test this out. So I did the same operation on this vector and this vector, and let's see what it looks like over here. Um, oh, whoops. Uh, this is, we don't want this on the designated face layer. I'm going to move this to this layer. Great. So this we're getting 1.2 to 10 to the negative 6, which is incredibly small, or uh, basically 0. And the more I move it, that's 5 degrees, 15 degrees. If I move them like this, you know, they're nearly orthogonal to each other. They're nearly at 90 degrees or 80 degrees to each other. Um, so it looks like it's a pretty good success so far. Um, so now I have uh, the degrees between vectors. Um, I want, uh, if the degree is smaller, they're nearly parallel to each other, right? So um, I can't, it's going to be pretty rare that I find a face that's exactly parallel, but I can have a set of tolerance. So I'm going to say my tolerance is uh, 10 degrees. All faces that are within 10 degrees of each other um, in terms of alignment, uh, I'm okay with. So this is where I use the dispatch function to filter, and I'll say uh, smaller than. So if the degrees between vector is smaller than 10. So if that's true, I'll get a true false list here. Then I'm going to, based on that true false list, I'm going to dispatch or sort um, the uh, a list into two. Now which list do I sort? I'm going to sort actually the initial faces. Um, so it's sorted into two lists. And if I grab this list, I'm going to hide everything. Um, I'm also going to wrap this in a face boundary. I'm going to bring this over here and plug this in. So these are all the faces within the mesh that are parallel to this face, which makes sense. And if I rotate this, uh, I should get all the faces in the mesh that are parallel to the surface. And they may not exist. Um, what I can do um, it might be that the mesh, the geometry of the mesh is just so that they don't exist. So what I can do is I can increase the tolerance. So I can say, okay, find all the surfaces that are roughly, uh, you know, within 26 degrees. Again, they might not exist, looks like it. Oh, but, uh, okay, so for example, if I do this, I get vastly more um, parts of the mesh. Um, So, looks pretty good. I think this is a pretty good success, actually. And yeah, if I rotate the surface again, um, I then get uh, these surfaces. Now, the other thing to actually look out for, which I uh, didn't realize, is um, you want, uh, sometimes, you may get uh, surfaces if you if you analyze the degrees between vectors, uh, some degree some uh, surfaces are five degrees away and some surfaces are 154 degrees away. Um, but because vectors have uh, or, or planes have uh, faces, there's a one face and another, and the vector has a direction depending on that. Uh, it's possible that we might find uh, vectors that um, two faces that are 100 degrees apart from each other, 180 degrees, but we would still consider that parallel or aligning. Um, so we also want this to catch an instance in which something is uh, 180 degrees um, uh, away from, or, or within a given tolerance away from 180 degrees. So what I'm actually going to do, instead of using smaller, is I'm going to use the subtract command. Um, and I'm going to say, when the degrees between vectors subtracted by 180 degrees, use the panel 
it's going to be within plus or minus an, a range, right? Um, in this case, you know, say negative 25. So this number is, uh, you know, s uh, negative 25 lower, smaller than 180. If this number is within the tolerance of 33, so if the absolute value of this number is smaller than our tolerance, then I'm going to be okay with that. So there's another set of true false values that I can use, and another dispatch that I can use to plug it in. And then uh, correspondingly, there's another set of geometry that I'm interested in, and then uh, another boundary function. So now it's acting more or less uh, performing accurately uh, because what I wanted to look at um, wasn't uh, it wasn't just one face. It was all faces that are parallel to the surface, and I don't really care about the direction of the uh, surface. So if I rotate it like that, I'll grab you know both uh, surface on this side and also on this side over here. So that's really great, and I am actually going to then merge these dispatches into one geometry node. Excellent. Now I have this uh, boundary unit. Um, so I'm going to clean up a little bit. So we're going to grab the mesh. I'm getting the faces, grabbing the faces to each other um, using a tolerance. This is my tolerance over here. Um, I'm going to hide this because I don't normally need this. Um, and now I have all these surfaces, or all these polylines that define surfaces. And then I want to hatch uh, the surface. Well, how do I do that? Um, there are a few ways um, to do this, but I actually think this is a good kind of stopping point or a moment in which uh, I can isolate this uh, as cluster because when I'm hatching the face I'm not really caring about their orientation I just want to know that uh, I'm grabbing all of these uh, and doing an operation on top of it so I can pretty much isolate this into its own cluster which is great um, the same goes for here actually I've already done this clustering which is excellent um, now I'm also going to then uh, clean up a little bit, make sure that uh, uh, everything is a little bit neat and organized. And then I'm going to also cluster this portion, because this is the portion that, given the degrees between vectors and a tolerance, grabs the faces. says grab faces um, great and this is a little neater so now uh, this portion is only um, doing the hatching so I'm going to double click and enter the uh, cluster so what I get is this geometry and I want to hatch this um, now there are a few ways to do this uh, but what I'm going to use is, I'm actually going to use the contour command. I'm just going to make lines across this face. And there are multiple contour commands. Um, the one I'm going to use, the one I'm going to use is uh, the contour without the X, that's a set of V over mesh contours. It takes in a B rep or a mesh, and you give it a start point, and then you give it a normal direction, um, and it contours along it. You know, so. We start out with uh, I'm trying to draw something for you. It looks like this tool doesn't work. That's okay. Um, so what we want to do is we want to uh, use the geometry, another geometry. We want to calculate a starting point, um, and we want to calculate the direction it's moving in. So how do we do that? Well, there's a few ways we could do it. We could uh, um, grab the normal direction that we used and do something with that. Um, one quick and dirty way is to use a bounding box. Um, 
I'm going to wrap everything into a bounding box. And if I do this, I'll get uh, multiple bounding boxes for each of the objects. But this is not what I want. What I actually want is a union box. So I want my box to be across all the objects. Um, and if I specify, so now I know I can find out um, where my starting point will be. You know, I can be one of the corners of this box. And then if I connect these two opposite corners to each other, then that direction, if I set that as my vector, um, will be uh, at sufficiently at, uh, let's hope that it's sufficiently at odds or uh, orthogonal or non-aligned with the plane so that when I do my contour, it slices them in an interesting way. So I have my box, um, and I'm going to do a uh, deconstruct BREP which will give me, most importantly, all of the vertices. And I'm going to sort the points. Um, this will sort it in the x direction, y direction, and z direction, which means that the first item in the points is most likely the lower right left, the lower left hand side corner, or the point that's smallest in x, y, and z directions. Um, so I'm going to set that as my starting point. As for the actual B-Rep or mesh to contour, I'm contouring this stuff. Now, I'm going to hide everything else. And just as a test, uh, I'm going to set my uh, contour in the Z direction. And I have to set a distance. So let's say my distance is 4 for the time being. And this is actually pretty effective. In fact, you know, this is not bad at all. Um, but the, d the Z direction kind of looks a little bit like um, I'm making floor plates. Uh, and this looks a little bit too kind of panelized. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get uh, the two most diametrically opposite posts uh, points on this box. So I have all these points. And I've sorted the points. I'm getting the first point. I'm also going to get the last point. So well, the thing you can do because the item uh, component has wrap is that my index, it starts at 1. As it starts at 0. I can use negative 1. Negative 1 will give me the last point. So then I'm getting the two opposite points on this box. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get these two points. I'm going to get the vector between the, those two points. I'm going to use that vector as my uh, normal direction, which will probably get me a relatively, a little bit more of an interesting uh, hatch pattern. Now, this isn't exact, and it's possible that depending on the orientation of the surface, the kind of hatchings I get are different. Um, what would be actually pretty accurate would be to analyze the uh, geometry of the surface and make a hatch that aligns with the surface so that the lines are at equal densities. Um, but that I will do in the other tutorial that does the same hatching, but in Python. And then, this is great. So I have all this geometry, and I'm just going to look at what I'm getting just for uh, simplicity's sake. It's a pretty complicated tree structure, so I'm going to simplify it. So it looks like uh, there are three branches, or three main branches, or four main branches off of which many branches exist. So that's my hatching pattern. And I am going to then plug it out as an output, since the purpose of this cluster was to make a hatch pattern. And so these are my faces. So I've hatched the face. Um, so the question is about previewing this geometry. Well, I will go ahead and make a preview. And I'm going to both preview uh, the initial uh, faces. Um, I'll preview both the face geometry and the wires at the same time to use a swatch component instead of the color picker just because it's a little more, more compact to display. I'm going to make sure I'm, I'm hiding everything. So I've controlled A, hidden everything, and I'm going to enable and show the preview. If I use the swatch, I'll be able to use transparencies. And I'm also going to show the uh, hatching faces. I'm going to use this. And then maybe for the hatch, I will have something a little bit more bit darker. Great. So this is successfully hatched um, those areas. You, know, you notice that um, 
the inside of this area is also hatched. Um, and that's again because we did uh, within the uh, the grab faces component um, or grab faces cluster, we wanted to grab all the faces that were aligned. Um, and let's see, I'm going to increase this tolerance and maybe move this around a little bit just to see if we can grab kind of a different view. Let's see what happens if I increase this tolerance uh, way high. Might be overly inclusive. Now you start to get um, a little bit random geometry, or you, you know, you're starting to hatch everything, which it looks interesting in of itself, um, actually. Uh, but it's not necessarily what we want, or we could. Um, so that's great. That's like one iteration of hatching. Um, now, as I mentioned at the start of the video, what I want to do is I want to not only just hatch it, I want to hatch it in relation to uh, some aspect. So maybe actually hatch it in relation to the data of the area, say, of these uh, meshes. So once I've grabbed these faces, uh, or, or what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the area function to get a list of all the areas and I'm going to plug it into grab f the grab faces cluster so that the grab faces cluster, using both the area and the degree between vectors, um, can intelligently hatch. Actually, no, that's not right. Um, I want to plug it in, give it into the uh, hatch faces cluster so that it can intelligently hatch um, the clusters we want. I'm going to use the input component. Get an input, it's a series of numbers. I'm going to save and close. Now you can see the input forming, and I'm going to give it a bunch of numbers. Now the problem with this is, um, how do, do we know which face to hatch what? And if you look at what I've gotten here, I've gotten a list of geometry. And it's unordered and it's unsorted, and I don't really know what's going on or which which face here corresponds to which area here. So I can do two things. One is I can either make uh, a tree structure um, that mimics uh, the um, the structure of the initial geometry, or I can just uh, find out and figure out uh, which uh, faces we took. Um, and I can pass that on. I can have a list of uh, faces that say, okay, we used this, 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 and this face. So what I'm going to do here is, right now we have around 45 uh, curves. I'm going to get the length of the list. So now we have 45 items, or 46 because we start at zero. And I'm going to plug this into a series so that I can generate a list of numbers between zero to 45. And I'm going to then use the dispatch command that uh, filters for both uh, uh, for, for the faces that are parallel to the designated face. And instead of using that for the geometry, I'm also going to use it for the series. So if I plug that in, what I'll get out in the A is, this is telling me that faces 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 are parallel to this face. I'm going to use this other dispatch function to do the same. It's telling me that these other faces are also parallel. Um, And then I'm going to combine these two into a single set of numbers. Excellent. Now the thing about this is we might have some duplicates. So I'm also going to create a set that automatically removes the duplicates for us. And then we have the singular set of uh, the inde indices, indexes of the panels that are parallel to this one. So this says, okay, panel number 21, 22, 23, 44 are parallel and onwards. So now we have the in indices of which panels are parallel. And we're actually gonna feed this into hatch face. Um, so this number is actually what we want over here. Or, or, or we want to have the areas, but we also want to have uh, these values too. So I'm going to double click on the hatch face and I'm going to expose an input. This is one of ways, one of a few ways to pass data, um, but I think this is pretty interesting and will come handy in other occasions, so I think it's helpful to know.
So I'm gonna pass this data over here. Um, and I'm going to rearrange this internals a little bit. So just as a recap, we're getting the area of all of the panels. We're also getting the, the, the panels that we're using, the specific panels that we're using. Um, and we have 25 values over here and 25 values over here. So if we do a list item command and we out of this list, we get these, uh, we use these as the lookup indexes, then it will tell us, okay, actually, it will give us a list of uh, the areas of each of these panels. Now, here's a funny thing. We could have actually just had the area component in here, right? Um, that would have been a, a much faster way to do this all. But sometimes it will happen in the case that when you're passing data into a cluster, um, you aren't necessarily passing all the data or only passing a certain part of the data. And so in other parts of the data, you might not be able to figure out from the geometry. In this case, we can use the area component to figure out what the area is from the geometry of passing. But you can do, if you imagine that uh, this is some sort of, say, you know, analysis from a GIS database or something, then there's a probably a lot of metadata, like, uh, for example, the name of the geometry that wouldn't be as easily passable. Um, so that you would pass a separate list of names, a separate indices of which geometry, and that way you could correlate the names of the geometry to the geometry. In this case, we're using the area and the geometry. So I have this list of areas, and I can do this a few ways. Um, I could change the hatching pattern or the frequency. I can change, um, and that's probably pretty interesting. Uh, so what I have right now is I have 25 polyline curves, and I'm going to graph them based on the polyline curves. Um, I still have one start point, one normal direction, and one distance between contours, and still giving me um, a bunch of lines. Now, what I can do here is I can modify the distance between contours to be a function of this list. What I'm going to use, I'm going to use the remap numbers function. I'm going to get the values, I'm going to get the bounds of the values. So this takes an input of a bunch of list of numbers and tells me the range or the domain, 106 to uh, 517. And I'm going to give it the target domain. So this is 0 to 1, but that's not what I want. I want my domain, uh, construct domain. I want my the distance between my contours to be, say, 3 to 10. And just to be safe, I'll set 2 to be my minimum. Say 3 to 8. And that will map all these numbers to these different distances. And then if I use the graph tool, then I have all these numbers on different branches. And this, so now if I plug this grafted uh, list into contour, it will match up these different frequencies with diff this different line. And then now you can see there's roughly probably a correlation between uh, the uh, gap between the lines and the frequency of the line. No, oh, sorry, the, the area of this, the the surface and the frequency of hatching. Is that the case? Let's see. Let's try to uh, make this a little bit more drastic, this difference between uh, So you can see this big chunk has a pretty sparse hatching pattern, whereas, oh, I see. Now, the other, other problem with this is that what's not perfectly working is we're also using uh, an arbitrary dimension. We're connecting these two points. So depending on where the geometry is, uh, even taking into this uh, distance, these fluctuating distances into consideration, the hatching pattern um, might be variable even if, for example, even if uh, the resolution or the frequency of the hatch is the same, because of the way the geometry is oriented, certain hatch patterns may look more frequent than others. So instead, what we're going to do is instead of using a normal normal direction 
uh, or, or, or the instead of having the normal vector be determined by the two ends of the bounding box, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each face, each and every face, and we will find, try to find um, the bounding box unique to it, um, try to find the vector within the bounding box um, that best accurately is uh, aligning along the surface, and we'll hatch with that. And that way, uh, we'll be confident that a uniform hatch um, at uh, place uh, applied onto the entire um, form will give us uh, a uniform distance will give us uniform hatches and so varying the distance will give us visibly varying uh, hatching patterns um, but I'll end this video because I think this is probably a good step to stop you know we already have this hatching pattern and you can save and close out of this cluster um, this is already a, a certain degree of representation because the second hatch uh, aspect um, goes into a little bit more detail uh, a little bit more kind of vector, uh, playing with vectors and math. So uh, you should look at the second video for um, a continuation of this. And again, if you want to implement this in Python in a more faster way, um, check the other Python tutorial for shading and hatches.